This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From the University of Pennsylvania, Perelman School of Medicine in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1017, recorded on June 14th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today, we are at a symposium uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. I can't remember the name of it. What is it called? Do you, do you have it? Yeah. Give me the piece of paper. I should have learned viruses. Should have. <laughs> Today, we are at the Center for Research, is that right, on coronaviruses and other emerging pathogens. Uh, the Symposium on Emerging Viruses. Thank you very much. We've had a series of talks today, and now we have grabbed uh, a few people from the meeting and a few people not from the meeting, and we're going to do a little twiv in front of uh, an audience of at least a thousand, <laughs> as far as I can tell. So um, joining me today, right on my left, who invited me to do this and who has been on twiv a couple of times before uh, from here at the University of Pennsylvania. Susan Weiss, welcome. Thank you. I think this is your Actually, third time. three times. This is your third Fourth time? Fourth time. Fourth. I've been on th four times total. OK, thanks for having me us here, and uh, welcome back. And also to Susan's left, also uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, the chair of the department, Rick Bushman, welcome. Thank you. Good to have you. Now, all the way on my right, uh, from Johns Hopkins University, Gigi Gronval, welcome to TWIV. Thank you. And also from the University of Pennsylvania on my right, uh, David, is it Johnson or Johansson? Johnson. Johnson, welcome to TWIV. Thank you. You look very sharp. I try. <laughs> <laughs> and we are going to talk about the origin of SARS-CoV-2. We thought we would chat a little bit informally about it. Um, and I want to do first, as a little backdrop for a discussion, I would like each of you to just tell us your expertise so that we can put it in the context uh, of this discussion. Now, Susan, you need no introduction because you've been working on coronaviruses longer than any living person, right? Not quite. No? <laughs> right. A couple of people longer. So you're a virologist. Yes. You've worked on coronaviruses your whole yes. career, mm -hmm. right? Not my, well, my whole, since my postdoc, yeah. Anything else we should know about you? No. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Go look at the other twins. But Rick, what do you do uh, relevant to this discussion? I'm the chair of the microbiology department. We've done um, work on many viruses over the years, HIV, um, SARS-CoV-2, with the um, emergence of the epidemic. We've done a great deal of work, some with my colleague Ron Coleman here, on the microbiome, including the microbiome meets SARS-CoV-2, metagenomics. When um, early in the epidemic, when there wasn't much sequencing going on, we um, were sort of the sequence observatory for Philadelphia, sequencing variants um, and trying to track the emergence of new strains in our region. And since others have taken over, but for a while we were the, the the main surveillance outfit there, and similarly setting, helping set up assays for rapid screening. We ran, we cooked up an assay with homemade ingredients that ultimately was used for 70,000 sequence, uh, 70,000 assays in our medical school to make sure people weren't walking around infected and not knowing it. So um, some recent work on Corona with Susan uh, and um, trying to find what we could do to help with the epidemic. Okay. Gigi, what, uh, what expertise do you bring to this uh, table here? <laughs> so my expertise is probably a little bit uh, unusual. So I have a background in immunology, but I've been working in health security or biosecurity for the last 20 years. And uh, I've, through that work, I've, I've uh, participated in some accident, lab accident investigations. Mm -hmm. I've traveled all over the world to different laboratories uh, for, to examine biosafety procedures. I um, have studied the history of, of biosecurity and, and biosafety. 
And uh, I've written about the origin of COVID, the SARS-CoV-2 with uh, in a political science journal called Survival and, and just last week at, in uh, New England Journal of Medicine with Larry Gostin. Okay, that's all great. And finally, David, what is uh, your background relevant to our discussion? My background is uh, I'm the executive director for the Center of uh, Ethics and the Rule of Law here at the University of Pennsylvania. But prior to that, I was uh, with the FBI for almost 24 years. And uh, though I didn't work directly with viruses, we did use some virology terms in dealing with particularly nasty defense lawyers. We would say they were particularly, <laughs> a, particularly a particularly virulent strain of lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. OK, so 24 years with the FBI. Should I be worried? <laughs> I think you're OK. okay. Very good. All right, so let's start. So let me, and I encourage all of you to jump in at any time whenever you hear something that you'd like to say. So I think I've heard a poll which says that over half of Americans polled uh, think that SARS-CoV-2 came from a laboratory. And um, to me, this is very disturbing as a person who's worked on viruses my whole career. And there, Susan, let's start the discussion. There are two scenarios. One is that the virus and, and this has to do with a laboratory in Wuhan, China, where the, the epidemic, the pandemic began, the uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology, that it was either purposefully made in a laboratory or that it accidentally escaped a laboratory. And I wanted to ask you, before we talk about SARS-CoV-2, did we have similar discussions with SARS in 2003? I, I don't think that we did. However, um, during the SARS-2 epidemic, pandemic, I received um, some anonymous uh, book that was describing that actually SARS-1 was, was made, was, was made by humans. The same scenario, although I hadn't heard it at the time. So there were, were, apparently there are people that think that that was the case. Okay. Which I don't, of course. So the idea, let's talk first about the idea that it was made in a laboratory. Susan, what are your thoughts okay, on that? Okay, I, I have a lot of thoughts about that. <laughs> I'm sure. I, I, think that, I think that that would have taken um, superhuman powers to make it in a laboratory because uh, as we were just chit-chatting about, I, don't, I think we, despite everything that we've done with SARS-CoV-2, I don't think that anybody knows on a like, kind of molecular level why it spreads the way it does or why it behaves the way it does. So the idea that any mad scientist could design it seems really, to me, seems quite ridiculous. Um, the, the other thing that is sort of magical thinking is that you can just think of a virus and design and make it like de novo. You have to have a template to start with. You have to have some RNA backbone of a genome to copy, and then you can modify it as, as you like. You wouldn't, might not know how to modify it, but you could modify it. But you would have to have a starting material. And as far as we know, there's no other virus reported that is similar enough to have been just tweaked into SARS-2. So for those reasons, I think that it's, um, it's just not plausible at all. So as you mentioned in, in when you introduced me, I yeah. made the first right. infectious DNA of an RNA animal virus. And in all the years we worked on it, it, it just is very difficult to modify viruses in any That's way right. at all. And I think if you don't have a history of doing that, you don't appreciate that. Right. For any virologist who has since modified uh, DNA copies of viruses, it just and, doesn't work most of the time. And a coronavirus is about four times the length of, of yeah. polio. So if polio is difficult to manipulate, think how much more SARS-CoV-2 is or any coronavirus. A few um, prominent individuals have gone on record saying that the furin cleavage site is a smoking gun for being made in a laboratory, which of it's, of course, it's not, but... Okay, that's, a, that's another kind of bone to pick, I think, because uh, furin sites were described in coronaviruses in the late 70s by K. Holmes. The, the spike protein was shown to have a furin site. Not all... Uh, this is in mouse hepatitis virus, and for mouse hepatitis virus, most isolates have a furin site. Some do not. Mm -hmm. The one that does not is, is highly infectious for mice. So at least in the context of MHV, I think that, it, or it looks like, the, the strains that have a furin site need it. The strains that don't have it don't need it. And even when we made mutants of this strain that has it, um, it was still 
pretty infectious and could cause quite severe disease. Mm. So in the case of SARS-CoV-2, I think if, if, it's, if the furin site is lost, it does become less pathogenic, but that's because it evolved to have one. SARS-1 is perfectly pathogenic without it. So right. to me, it's kind of a, a really a, a non-starter. And, and the idea that someone took it from HIV and put it into coronavirus, we knew about it in coronaviruses before we ever heard of HIV. So. It's, it's kind of a backward, backward thinking. So but The, the idea yeah. that you could have put a furin site in requires that you have something close to SARS-CoV-2 to begin with. Right, and in, in fact, if you stick a furin site where it doesn't belong, it may, it may have the opposite effect. It may give you a dead virus. I, I don't think that mm. it's predictable. The idea that I know there's this thing floating around about the, the grant proposal that was to put furin sites into viruses. It may or may not have even helped the virus it may have killed the virus. Yeah, so what you're referring to is, I think, a EcoHealth Alliance NIH application, which talked about putting fear in sites, right. but was right. never funded. Was never funded, and right. Anyway, I don't care if it was funded. I don't care if they did the experiments or not. Me it, neither. It, you, you didn't have SARS-CoV-2 close enough to, to no. modify it, right? It That's it, 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 it's ridiculous, really. But then if you make this kind of argument, the naysayers, who let's call them the lab leakers, will say, well, how do you know someone didn't have SARS-CoV-2 somewhere in some laboratory? That's something you really can't 100% know. But I, I, th I think personally, if it had been in the Wuhan lab, there are enough people in that lab that, that it would have leaked, that information would have leaked, yeah. not the virus would have leaked. And I, I have another kind of thing about leaking viruses. When I, I always ask people, what do you mean that the virus leaked, right? Viruses can't get up and walk out of the room. They have to be inside of a person. And, and if you have like, you know, a mixture, say, of viruses from, from bat guano, you're going to have very small amounts of those viruses. And most of the, quote, virus in, in the bat guano is sequences, and it's not actually infectious virus. Like how Eric said, you hardly ever see infectious virus yeah. when you see genomes. So, okay, so the idea that that small amount of virus could get into a person, it's possible, but it doesn't seem that, that likely to me. I think, you know, when you have lab leaks, like for SARS-1 leaked, so to speak, in the lab, not leaked, it infected somebody in the lab, it was because they were working with it. It would be like working with an isolated virus and growing it up, mm -hmm. having enough of it that you could aerosolize it or something like that. But I think it's much less likely to just inadvertently get infected by a small amount of virus. It's not impossible. Gigi, have you ever looked at the, the SARS-1 lab associated infection? What, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, it was very different. Um, I mean, it was tragic because there's a, one researcher who got infected and, and then ended up giving uh, the virus to her mom who died. Uh, the, China acted in a very uh, different way than, you know, than the lab leakers accused China of acting this time around. Um, they closed down the facility. They notified WHO. They uh, they had a moratorium on research for some time. They uh, they had people monitor symptoms. So I mean, it was a very outward, transparent for them public health response. Mm -hmm. So that was in response to the laboratory accident of SARS-CoV-1. For SARS-CoV-2. There, I mean, you, you asked, you know, how did people get this idea? I mean, we can't forget that the president of the United States declared that this was a laboratory accident. And so I think a lot of people formed their impressions of, of that just right from, the, you know, that author, authoritative in their mind's source that, you know, that the, the president said so. And more recently, the former CDC had testified the same thing, that it definitely came from a lab. Former FDA. Former CDC. Oh, yeah, Redfield. Other, yes, Robert Redfield. Redfield. Yep, yep. Yeah. Um, so when I think when the public hears uh, those sorts of people, they, they sure. tend to believe it. So the SARS-1 incident, was that, what was the containment being done at the time? Do you know? I don't recall. Um, I think it was BSL-3, but there was, an, there was, there was some uh, incorrect procedure. Um, there were a couple of different incidents with SARS-CoV-1 in Taiwan and China, and I've uh, jumbled them together because in one case there was a problem with a filter and somebody went to investigate mm, it and okay. got their nose you know, real close to... to where they shouldn't have, um, but it was, you know, it was procedures that were not were not followed correctly. 
And in that case, they were growing large amounts of the virus in culture already. I think so. Right? Yeah, I mean, it, was, it wasn't very at the very beginning. So that's yeah. very different from having, say, a specimen in an animal where, right. as you said, they're, they're was... very small amounts. Rick, do you have any thoughts about these, some of these issues? Well, um, we don't really have any supporters of the lab leak hypothesis on this panel. Um, <laughs> so let me articulate what I think will be the, what I think are the best arguments. Um, I think the lab leak hypothesis people generally don't make their own best case. So let me try. So <laughs> first, what was the origin? Um, there are lots of pandemics that are clearly known to have started with jumps from animals. No pandemic is known to have started with a lab leak. There are coronaviruses that have been found in the wild that are 95% identical uh, in bats in Southern Asia. Some have been shown to infect human cells. So there's lots of reasons to think a zoonosis is likely and none to think that a lab leak is likely. But what are the best arguments for the lab leak? Well, there are lots of bad arguments. One is that you can't be sure that A and B didn't happen that proves A and B are true. We sort of heard that one in the last panel we were on. Or what about Bigfoot? What about a lab leak? Can you prove it wasn't a lab leak? Can you prove Bigfoot wasn't involved? And you know, no, but it doesn't seem very likely. Um, and we, we, you touched on uh, the virus. It's unlikely the virus was created by de novo synthesis in a laboratory. The, the virus shows no signs of being made by uh, previously known pieces. So if you want to say it was synthesized, you have to say it was from previously unknown parts. And furthermore, you don't know how to engineer asymptomatic spread, which is obviously what's one of the biggest things here. So one of the reasons, another weak argument is uh, touched on also, there's this Institute of Virology in Wuhan. So maybe it came from there, but physically it was like four miles away at the wet market that it seems to have started. And furthermore, I've never heard anyone say, well, suppose you pick a city arbitrarily and ask, was there some kind of lab there that would be likely to be an origin? There's a big molecular biology lab in Beijing. What if it came from Beijing? What about Philadelphia? We have a well-known coronavirus researcher here, a BSL-3 lab, Department of Microbiology. I mean, you could make up a story I think about many cities. Um, and lastly, another weak argument, the Chinese are concealing stuff. And their response has been consistently lame. We, we heard about that. Um, the ex explanation we've been getting seems to be, well, maybe it came in with frozen food, um, which is self-serving nonsense. But it's sad in that you know, it's putting the origin outside China. And so people are protecting themselves in a repressive society. You know, the, uh, anybody who was blamed for it could get in big fat trouble and their family harmed or something. So what are the best arguments? Um, well, um, if you search Wikipedia on lab leak, and this was sort of coming up, you get like 50 examples. And some of them are kind of lame, but many are you know, tragic. As we heard, smallpox infections, getting uh, some lab worker working with smallpox, getting infected and dying. I mean, there def it definitely has happened over and over that agents in labs were contained well enough and somebody got infected. Um, and then another point that I think is a sort of w argument worth thinking about, there's a step that's unclear in any model, which is it, how did the virus get to the Wuhan wet market where it was first um, observed? Was it from a lab? Was it from an animal that was infected coming into the market, a person infected? So I think it's not off the table to imagine there was someone from the lab who was exploring caves in southern China, got infected, and then went back to Wuhan and like coughed on an animal in the market or something like that. That's one candidate explanation, though certainly there's no evidence for it. So just this un, un, unexplained step in any model of how the virus got where it started, I think, you know, that's it's on the table that something about the lab could have been a factor. Although some of those, it's not even clear it's a leak. It, maybe it never went in the lab and came out again, but rather was somebody like coughed on a person in the wet market. So well, could, I, could I answer that? Sure. <clears throat> As we didn't get to it yet, but the other scenario, of course, is that there were specimens in the laboratory, bat specimens. But, but I understand that when you collect them, they, they immediately go into trizol and, and they're inactivated. So what's in the laboratory is no longer infectious virus. So anyway. Well, then how could they get infected viruses out of the guano, which is something that well, they want to do? Well, they haven't apparently very, done it very okay. effectively. So you know, the, mm -hmm. the pre-pandemic, the closest virus, the closest SARS 
like virus was RATG13, which was still 1,200 bases away, but they didn't have infectious virus. And I can't tell you how many journalists I talked to wanted to know if this could have been modified to make SARS-CoV-2, but they don't even have infectious uh, virus for it. But, but uh, uh, the, the, the best evidence comes from work of Warby, Michael Warby and his colleagues who have shown that the Huanan market was the epicenter and that there in fact were two lineages that started very early, so in fact two spillovers. Yeah. So very hard to imagine. If someone from the lab brought it, the lab should have also been an epicenter. You might, you might have thought so, yeah. <clears throat> and the, I mean, the Warby data is a little bit ambiguous, the, the Chinese. So what that is, if any of you don't follow it, there was sampling all through the market several weeks after the start of the pandemic, and samples were found that were positive. And quite recently, they were sequenced to look for what, else, what other kinds of sequences could you find there. So there were some human sequences, some raccoon dog sequences, so maybe it was an infected raccoon dog, and lots of other stuff, just random fish and things from the wet market. So the data was kind of low quality. It's, it's somewhat ambiguous. They, they may well have cited an infected raccoon dog because they had SARS-CoV-2 positive and raccoon dog, although that was argued against by Jesse Bloom. But anyway, the... Um, the um, Point being that, the, the, probably the biggest point though, is that this was several weeks after the start. And even if that was an infected raccoon dog, that wasn't the raccoon dog that started the epidemic sure, or something. Sure. This is just saying it's spreading in the market. Yeah. Can I mean, jump in here? Yeah, of course. So there's, I mean, a lot of the, the discussion of like, what the, were the Chinese lying about, about what happened? I mean, yes. There was a lot of lying that was going on, um, not only by China, but by the U.S. accusing China of starting the pandemic. Um, there was a lot of Russian disinformation in this as well of where this pandemic started. But the question is, why? Why was you know why were people being uh, lying about it? And so so. The, some of the actions right after um, it seemed like many of the cases, more than half of the early cases, were connected to the market, mm -hmm. and the the market was closed down. Right. So then you didn't have the animals to be able to to take samples from, and so we have to infer, you know, well, why? What can what what was there before? Um, in the early, for the first year, the Chinese insisted that there was no legal activity going on at that marketplace. And, and, and of course, you know, part of that illegal activity was the presence of raccoon dogs, the presence of mink and other animals that were being sold illegally um, that, you know, for, for a high price that should not have been there. So I, I appreciate Jesse Bloom pointing out the value of that specific piece of information, whether or not you could tell if there was a raccoon dog that was actually infected at the market. But the fact is, there shouldn't have been a raccoon dog there. And, and why would a susceptible animal be and where you would expect it to be um, in, and you know, have samples of the, on the hair and feather removal machines and so forth that are positive? What I've, so the data are not perfect because as on January 1, the market was shut down and sanitized. But it, what I find interesting, the environmental sampling does show the two lineages, but also shows most of the positive samples are in the part of the market where mammals were sold, not where the fish or other, which makes, you know, it's all internally consistent, right. at least. Consistent with spreading, but that doesn't mean that's exactly where it started. It just seems that it was there those weeks later. Well, for the, to have most of the early cases, though, it seems like it most likely originated. And I would say that uh, well, we had Michael Warby on TWIV, and he, he presented this very well. And um, we're, he's probably listening now and um, screaming at us, but um, <laughs> go listen to, to the way that he presented it. But, but Gigi, I thought um, you've, you've written a lot about um, lab, lab accidents and security and so forth, and I wonder if you could talk about two specific ones that are useful. One is the 1977 uh, H1N1, and then the Sverd loss accident in sure. these terms. So over the course of, uh, of the last several years, the lab leakers have pointed to, well, this kind of thing has happened before. You know, in 1977, the flu that year was, came from a freezer. It did not come from, uh, it was not naturally circulating. It, it, it was the same strain that, as an uh, earlier strain from the 1950s. So there was, you know, unless um, 
you know, our views of, of viral evolution are vastly different than, you know, than all other evidence. Like it definitely was not a natural event. So the question is, well, what, what was it? And so uh, this is, this was t over 10 years ago, I guess, or about 10 years ago, we, we examined the different possibilities for where this virus came from, where, why the flu that year was a, basically a repeat from the 1950s. And we looked at the potential of a biological weapons attack, which you know makes sense sort of if you think of the, the people who are most sick were young people because they were not exposed to this virus that had been circulating in the 1950s. And uh, the Air Force Academy had to actually shut down for the first time in its history and things like that. Um, we looked at the potential for a, uh, a laboratory accident, but um, but what we learned more was that you know some some of the features of the virus, some of the temp temperature sensitivity of the strain of virus that you, of that strain that went uh, that became epidemic. And um, also a communication made to a, a U.S. researcher, Peter Palacio, um, said that, you know, they were concerned about this virus and attenuated vaccines were all the rage in that time. And they inoculated thousands of military recruits and it reverted and became a pandemic. So that's where, where most of the evidence lies versus like somebody drops a beaker somewhere and, and then, and then mm. starts a pandemic. But that incident is often cited by uh, lab leakers as an example of a lab escape, which not really correct, right? It's more like a medical, it's a, med it's a public health disaster, um, yeah. but it's not, it's not a laboratory accident in that somebody, you know, injects themselves and gets sick and that, that sort of thing. I mean, it's sadly, laboratory accidents happen, you know, they, they do happen and, um, and it's important to investigate them, do what we can to learn from them and prevent them. But uh, 1977 was probably not a laboratory accident. Has any uh, laboratory accident led to an epidemic or a pandemic of an infectious disease? There have been a couple where there's been forward transmission. So like the one you mentioned, where the researcher working with SARS-CoV-1 mm -hmm. ended up infecting their, their mother. Um, there's been a few cases like that with really close contacts, but, but not nothing, no epidemic, no pandemic. So the other, uh, the other case that's an example is uh, biological uh, weapon development and accidents that happen. They're often cited as lab accidents. Yeah, this one is a little bit more offensive to me because <laughs> um, so the, the, uh, and at the time, um, the Soviet Union had an illegal clandestine biological weapons program. Like they really should not have had thousands of scientists working towards this end, but they did. And they, there was a, an anthrax weapon facility that uh, in this place called Sverdlovsk, it's since been renamed. Um, but there was, since declassified intelligence uh, has shown that there's an explosion at the lab or an explosion at the facility. It was a manufacturing facility. And some people died of anthrax in the days following that initial explosion. And then there was another wave of deaths as the anthrax settled and got uh, eaten by cows and then people ate the cows and then they got sick and died. Like, it's a, a terrible accident, but I mean, it's, it's, it's not a lab and it's not, it's not a legal activity. Like, there's nothing, there's, there's just nothing that is really applicable to, to the present day. Um, when it comes to that. And, and the other incident that people bring up too is the smallpox um, infection. Poor Janet Parker, the medical photographer mm -hmm. in uh, University of um, Birmingham in England, um, that, you know, she, it looks like she may have been illegally selling film at the time, like before, you know, had digital photography um, and film was really expensive. But she may have been visited the smallpox lab, and um, and so, I mean, it was a terrible affair. But it's you know, it was definitely something that is less likely to happen today. I think that was also before we did proper containment. The, the, the smallpox at that time was being worked on in a laminar flow hood, or maybe even on the bench. So it's hard to compare it with today, where we are very careful about containment. Susan, do you know anything about the lab in Wuhan that would be informative? Uh, not really. I don't have any first-hand information. No. Except that, no. that Zhang Li is 
was trained in the West, right? Knows Western procedures. And I certainly respect her. Yeah. Yeah, she does. Uh, so, David, the, uh, several months ago, the FBI concluded, or at least the, the press is saying they did, that the SARS-CoV-2 most likely came from a laboratory, and it's, uh, that conclusion is of low confidence. So I wonder if you could tell us, so what, what, I know you're not involved, you weren't involved in that at all, but what would the, you know, scientists want phylogenetic trees. What would the FBI be looking for, and, and what does low confidence mean? Um, let me caveat my statements for that. I do not speak for the FBI. I'm not sure. with the FBI. <laughs> and I don't speak for Penn. Uh, but I do have um, the intelligence um, classifications, the confidence levels. If that, if that would be helpful, I can read through these quickly to say, sure, you know, sure. what, what is what. Now, and I, I wrote them down just so I get it correct here. Um, something that's deemed high confidence, the FBI's judgments are based on high quality information or that of a nature of the issue makes it possible to render a solid judgment. Medium confidence generally means that the information is credibly sourced and plausible, but can be interpreted in various ways or is not of sufficient quality or corroborated sufficiently to warrant a higher level of confidence. Low confidence generally means that the information's credibility or plausibility is questionable. The information is too fragmented or poorly corroborated to make sol uh, solid analytic inferences for the FBI has uh, serious concerns or problems with the sources of the information. So hmm. what does that all mean? Um, <laughs> the intelligence community is uh, made up of, I think, 18 or 19 different agencies, and they have various areas of expertise. Um, the, the CIA, for example, is international intelligence and what's going on. The FBI is more a domestic law enforcement agency, but it's also the only one of the intelligence community that's also a national security agency. Um, so they will look at various streams of information that they have, intelligence, human source reporting, uh, signals intelligence, um, any kind of over captures that they get on any of the countries that are involved here and they will analyze it and then come up with opinions or not decide not to come up with opinion. Um, one of the agencies that I think is interesting that hasn't opined on this is the, um, the National Center for Medical Intelligence. It's a sub subset of the Department of Defense Intelligence Agency. Um, infectious diseases and uh, pandemics, that is their, uh, their bailiwick. They track things all over the world and come up with ideas of how does that impact the United States and the United States national security. And to my mind, they have been uh, silent with this. So that kind of leads me to believe that they don't know, or they don't have enough information. But one thing I wanted to say too, um, you, you had referenced about uh, former President Trump talking about that the Chinese uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, the Kung flu, and it was released here or there. Um, a lot of these statements are made in the backdrop where a large portion of the American population is basically scientifically illiterate. Um, I read an article that said that a, a, a majority of the public thinks that homo sapiens and di dinosaurs were on the earth at the same time. And um, you know, anyone with a basic scientific knowledge knows that that's not true. So I think these ideas, you know, people don't know the difference between a virus and a bacteria. Um, so it's very easy to mislead and manipulate people with these things. So if, if from what I understand from your uh, the definition of low confidence, why would they conclude then that it came from a laboratory if they have really very low confidence of their ability to conclude that? I think the FBI came out with intermediate confidence. It was medium confidence. Oh, it was medium. Yeah. Um, I don't know what they looked at. Like I said, I wasn't involved in this. Mm, um, yeah. I do know that they have uh, analysts. Um, they will consult with scientists. So they had some basis to make this. I just do not know yeah. what that is. I mean, another thing is, um, and I, I've talked to Susan about this, where in, intelligence officials don't believe in coincidences. They will say something happened by this lab. You know, the, the, the chances of that happening are so remote that there must be something here. And truth be told, China has not helped itself in this situation whatsoever. 
Um, they've obfuscated information. They've put stuff on the web, taken it down, mm -hmm. um, have basically tried to blame the United States for this, that we planted this there to, you know, to stop China's rise. Um, and their number one uh, rule, uh, modus operandi, is don't embarrass China internationally. Sure. Um, so I think there's a fair bit of that involved here. I think there's also, I mean, so there's a concept that comes from the intelligence world called you know, mirror imaging that it's really important to, to keep in mind here because um, if you, you know, mirror imaging is is when you know somebody does something and you think, why do they do that? If I if they did if I did that, I would be guilty. And so you assume that you know your your actions are on the person you're observing, and you know the lying and the obfuscation is is evident. I mean, there's been a lot of it, um, but you know it's important to investigate. Like, why is that, and does it necessarily mean, you know, would it be the same thing that it would mean if I were in that situation? And, and it's important to think about this because intelligence can often be wrong and has been wrong pretty spectacularly and many times over the last couple of decades because people have, uh, have projected their opinions and their actions onto their adversary. Yeah, in, in the law it's called consciousness of guilt, mm -hmm. that you, why are they behaving that way? They're guilty, which is not necessarily the case here. Um, and one of the best definitions of intelligence I've ever heard, it's a wilderness of mirrors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because you don't know what's going on, um, but there are intelligent successes that the public does not know about. And I will cite to one that's been written about is with the Russian aggression into Ukraine. Mm -hmm. The US intelligence knew what they were gonna to try to do with coming up with a cover story and uh, like basically a black flag thing that the Ukrainians attacked them and they're Nazis and basically put all that out there and Russia and Putin was shut down from using those excuses. Yeah, that was a huge success. And I don't mean to imply that the IC is always wrong. Like I just, that, you know, that it's sometimes that some of these high profile events and um, whether it's WMD in Iraq, or you know that the that the World Trade Center is not going to get attacked a second time, or things like this, that intelligence can can lead people astray. Absolutely. So this this may be unanswerable, but in hearing the these pronouncements from the intelligence community, one wonders if they have additional information. Is there any way of knowing? Any way of sensing? Is, is there more to it than we're detecting? Um, I don't know. Um, generally. The way it's supposed to work post 9-11 is that they all have the same intelligence and they're sharing intelligence. Um, that's in a perfect world. Sometimes uh, agencies will have something that's so uh, exquisitely sensitive that they might not share nice with the others. I'm not suggesting that happen here or any of that has happened, but um, those are kind of some of the lenses to look th through this. I, th I think it's so hard for us, as, we as scientists who look at data and look for mm -hmm. uh, hard facts for why we make a, dis a conclusion, to, to listen to the Department of Energy in particular and, and keep, there was that huge headlines about them um, saying with, with low confidence they thought it came out of the lab without anything to substantiate it. And what is that all about? I mean, it's, yeah. Um, it's such a different style. Yeah, it's, it, it's intelligence isn't science, it's an right. art. It's, you know, there, there's information, there's wonderful technology, um, and, uh, but it, it is not a science. It's not mathematics where two plus two equals four. Um, there's human judgments. There, two people can look at the same fact pattern or the same witness and say, I think they're credible. And then someone else will look at them, no. I, don't, I, don't, I think they're shifty. I think they're, they're, they're going to go sideways on this, and you know it's a judgment call at the end of the day. So you are now a civilian. You're not an FBI agent any longer, correct? I am not, no. So you can look at this through the lens of a civilian, because this happened after you left the FDI. And, and I'm just curious, uh, you're not a virologist, but when you heard that, did you, did you have any particular thoughts? Um. Personally, you know, China is uh, an enormous threat uh, to the, in the future and currently with the U.S. with espionage and spying. And uh, so I always kind of have my antenna up in that regard. But 
I don't know enough facts about this to opine one way or another, or I feel you know, I'm not scientifically qualified to do that. But are you confident, though, that, that these intelligence agencies have facts, or it's just thinking something shifty or not shifty? I don't know. I don't know what they're, because a lot of this is classified. And then I think at the end of the day, the, one of the things that they came out with is that until China releases all the information and data, that it's an imperfect data set and you can't really make a determination. What do they mean by all the information and data? What, what do they want from them? I think some of the uh, stuff that they put up on the web and took down, mm -hmm. and then just, you know, what happened? What, what are the report? What are their internal, what was their internal investigation? You know, they, I guarantee they conducted a very detailed investigation to try to find out what happened here. Mm -hmm. um, and will they release that or, you know, some unclassified version of it? From, from what I understand, the sequences that were taken down were put back up. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And they're complete as far as we can tell, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, there have been now three reports on it. The first, the War B one then the Chinese um, George Gao report, and then uh, Jesse Bloom opining on the, the three of them. And there's, there's some difference in the conclusions they reach. I think a lot of it comes down to technical stuff, dealing with low quality data and where do you set your thresholds? How much SARS-CoV-2 sequence do you find or not, depending on your quality filtering and stuff like that. Bloom, I think, filtered harder than the others, although it would take a lot of detective work to figure out exactly what happened. Um, the Chinese and uh, the Warabi analysis seem to agree more with each other, finding um, um, raccoon dog <laughs> raccoon dog in the Warabi or Canis in the Chinese. Uh, in one particular, the sort of southwest corner of the market, as you mentioned, one particular sample. Um, they were labeled differently, but it seemed like it was the same sample and um, uh, positive for SARS-CoV-2. So like a, what looked very likely to be an infected raccoon dog. But but then what does that mean? Did a person infect the raccoon dog? Did a raccoon dog infect an imperson, a person? I think it just says the virus was there and might well have been in that animal. It's still more data than supports any other scenario, right? So, so Gigi, you mentioned China being uh, dishonest and so forth, and that's interpreted by lab leakers as trying to hide a lab leak. But I would say they're very embarrassed that the market is the source and that shouldn't, as you said, it was illegal to have the markets open. They, they were closed after SARS-1, correct? Yes. And so, then they reopened? So after SARS-1, uh, the, the markets were open. They were able, there were a bunch of, you know, civet cats there to, to be tested. Um, and, and, you know, that was how the, the epidemic was figured out. But in this case, the market was closed. So there were only environmental samples to be taken. And uh, maybe, I mean, who knows? Maybe they did take live animal samples and we just don't know that. Yeah. But uh, well, you know, it's I, I actually asked George Gao that, the former mm -hmm. head of the Chinese CDC. He presented on SARS-CoV-2 at a meeting in Spain a couple of months ago. And this had all just come out. And he said, we, we tested animals and we couldn't find any that were positive. And so I asked him uh, after the talk, well, th that sounds very important. Could you tell us you know, how many animals you tested? Where did you test them? When did you test them? And he sort of filibustered for five minutes and then <laughs> stopped without answering the question. Hmm. Well, it should be pointed out that very, very close to the beginning of 2020, he published a paper in a China CDC journal saying the, the market was the origin and that's why we shut it down. And then, of course, that story changed. But I think his first reaction as an epidemiologist was the correct one, and he was forced to change, and that's what he's doing to this day. But, but did he have sequences that that statement was based on, or just that's what he thought happened? Well, he might have. They weren't published. Yeah. But uh, the, the article, which is still online, you can, you can see the conclusion. And I've heard from others that, that he told them uh, the same thing. So. You know, there's obviously a desire to change the the, uh, the narrative, and that can feed into both scenarios, unfortunately. Yeah, right? I think people are fearful in China and don't want to yeah. get in trouble with the senior leadership. Well, um, we're not going to find out any more information. I mean, our opportunities to get more information have are are gone. So, I mean, there was a World Health Organization visit. There was there was that whole process. Um, maybe people weren't as satisfied with it as they you know, as they wanted it to be. They maybe it wasn't as informative as they wanted it to be. But that kind of diplomatic 
quasi-scientific investigation visit process is was as good as it was going to get. And it could have gone on for a lot longer. But because of people being you know, outraged about it, the Chinese did not see a value in cooperating. And so I don't think we're going to see any more of that. Yeah, and I, I, if I may interject, too, yeah. that uh, this COVID origins isn't the only thing that China will um, obfuscate and lie about. They were presented uh, in open source intelligence of aerial satellite photos of uh, basically concentration camps for the Uyghur minority. And they, oh, no, 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 those are uh, education camps and we're not hoarding people up. And then you show them the picture and they, are you gonna believe me or your lion eyes? And so that's something too that's to be. Mm -hmm. I thought you were gonna mention the balloons. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you need to explain the balloons now. The, the, the satellites, you know, the... Oh, those balloons, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those balloons, okay. There's probably one hovering above us now. Susan, um, <laughs> we had more information for, in terms of animals for SARS-1, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, it was found in civet, I think raccoon dogs, and maybe even some other animals in, in that market. So that's why it seems like that would be the, the default uh, assumption or presumption that that's what happened again because it, it clearly happened the first time. So the market for SARS was allowed to stay open longer and... The Which you probably knows, I don't know exactly, but they did get the animals, right? Yeah, they tested, they did an investigation and, and were open with the world about what was yeah. happening there. But I think, you know, uh, one thing that hasn't been mentioned yet is how much money goes into the illegal wildlife trade. And mm -hmm. and so there's, the estimates are really, the error bars are huge, but uh, estimates in China alone, the illegal wildlife trade have ranged from like seven or eight to $75 billion a year. So that's more than the U.S. beef industry. That's a lot of money and a lot of like, gravity um, to, for anyone to step in the way of. And so, you know, I think anything, I mean, one possible reason why the, the market was closed was because, you know, people did not want to get in trouble because what they were doing was against the law. And there was a lot of people who let that activity go on because of the profit motive. So, I mean, it just, there's a lot of other reasons why people could be lying or could act the way they do that are not um, because of a laboratory leak. Are the markets still closed as far as we know? I thought I heard that they were open again. Do you think they should be closed permanently? I don't think that you can close something that people really want so much um, mm -hmm. that, you know, that they will go to legal lengths to, to get it. Um, and, but I think that there are safer ways to sell animals uh, than the way that, that they were doing it. And mm -hmm. if you could regulate that in industry and make sure that the animals were more healthy and that the uh, butchering was done in a much separate place than you know, where yeah. they were kept and all the things, you know, the WHO has re very detailed guidance on how to operate a wet okay. market. And maybe you could sample them for coronaviruses too, right? Yeah. Make sure before you bring them yeah, in that yeah. they're and that market sells other things as well, right? I mean, I was in that market and I'm trying, I don't remember if I saw, I was there in 2016 and I can't remember if I saw animals, those animals, but there were other things being sold. It was a really- you mean live things? No, no, other non-live things. Like cell phones? No, 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 like, <laughs> what do you like, mean? like fruits and vegetables. It's, okay. it's a big okay. market. It's sort of like Reading Terminal with the addition okay. of the civet sales. That was actually what really uh, got me focused on it was the, so the WHO report that people were upset about because it, it said that a laboratory leak was very unlikely. Um, I'm reading, reading, kind of, you know, sort of interesting, informative, but on page 98 of this 120 page report, there was a paragraph about how uh, there, was, there was no illegal activity that was found in the market. And even though illegal animals had at one point been uh, noted to have been present at that, at that market. It was not the case that there were illegal animals there in 2019. And I read that and I was like, oh, for crying out loud, like, like there's no political leader anywhere in the world, I would think, that would say that there was no illegal activity going mm. on at the market. I'm just trying to imagine like, you know, the mayor of Philadelphia saying, you know, there's no illegal activity going on in the public market. Sure. Uh, so David, back to you, I wanna sure. understand how the FBI works. You can not answer any of these. So the FBI stays in the US. Or would it go to China and try and figure out things? 
we, uh, the FBI is in, I think, 64 different countries at embassies. Oh, okay. um, so they're very limited, though. They have no law enforcement mm -hmm. powers. They're basically in the embassy, and it's more of a liaison function. Uh, unlike China, who was recently in the New York Times had opened up 100 police departments in foreign countries, uh, including New York, um, that were basically set up to harass Chinese nationals in the United States to try to get them to come back to China mm. Um, mm -hmm. or harass them in other ways. And they denied that it was a police department until uh, in one of the countries, they actually had a picture of the sign and in Chinese it said, Chinese police. And then the <laughs> next day, and miraculously, the sign was changed to say, Chinese tourist help station. <laughs> um, and actually two, uh, People in New York were indicted and arrested um, for cooperating with the Chinese uh, police department that they had in Manhattan. And it, it was a big operation too. So, so the FBI could have been in China at the embassy during yeah, this investigation. Right? But they would not be allowed to go out and, and look at any of that stuff. They right. would basically be uh, festooned around the embassy, you know, within 20 mm -hmm. miles where they're not allowed to venture okay. out. So I'm trying to understand what kind, so you said they, they monitor chatter, right? The, the talking that goes on and, and try and glean something from that? Yeah, there could be, you know, it depends on what um, systems are in place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, countries spy on each other all the time. Um, it's a game that's been going on for centuries, or if not millennia. Sure, sure. Um, so there could be something they gleaned from that. There could be human sources that someone defected Mm -hmm. who knew somebody and says, oh, you know, X, Y, Z. So that's something that, that could be a potential of, an, of, of potential intelligence value as well. So uh, from your vantage point, do you have an opinion on, about the origin of SARS-CoV-2? Um, I think it probably happened from, a, from an animal to a human and probably was not in a lab um, in China. But I don't know that 100%, just until all the cards are on the table. Okay. Um, is it, how important is it to sort this out? Is it, or will it be possible to do that? I'd be very surprised if it can ever be figured out. I mean, it might be possible to find viruses that are in bats in Southern Asia that are closer, still closer to SARS-CoV-2 and make it seem more and more and more likely. But unless there's like, specimens from patients really early uh, that are analyzed really thoroughly uh, in, from Wuhan, it, it doesn't seem very likely there's going to be any clear answer. I suppose there could be a smoking gun in favor of the lab leak hypothesis. You find all the intermediate DNA constructions in somebody's freezer or something like that, but, and, and that, maybe that could be a fully definitive answer, but it seems highly unlikely for all the reasons we've been discussing. What, what kind of evidence would you want to pinpoint the origin? Well, I mean, I, I think Rick is right. If, if you could find it in the lab, then it would suggest that as unlikely as, as it is. Well, that's what the lab leakers would say, that you have, it's there and we just can't find it. And that's, that's their story. Well, that, that's but sort of the, big foot, that's the, the Bigfoot argument. Yeah, yeah, but the epidemiology doesn't support right. that. Right. But let's say, as we all likely think, the, the, it originated in the market. So how do we prove that beyond what we have already? Get more, get more samples from animals that are consistent with an early spread? Well, the metagenomic samples were several weeks um, yeah. after the, the, the inferred introduction. So if you could get earlier samples and match those up with something you found in a cave and find a patient who had been in the cave and then been in the market, I don't know. Well, finding in, in the bat, a really similar one in the bats would at least cut out the thing about it being manufactured, I yeah. think, if you could find a really close uh, ancestor. But that wouldn't really prove how it got into the market. Yeah. I, I found a quote by Jeffrey Sachs, who unfortunately is my Columbia colleague. He said the NIH and the Wuhan Institute collaborated to make SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> collaborated. You know, collaboration is already difficult. I, I find it when people say scientists all agreed to conspire about this, it's laughable because we can't even agree on anything, right? <laughs> but does he say beyond that, I mean, beyond that fantasy, how, how you know, you need some detail if you're going to say something like that. Well, maybe they're thinking about the Peter Dajak example where yes. in the grant update or final report, they showed some chimeric viruses where they had taken um, like naturally occurring vi 
viruses had taken their spikes and put them sure. into a known virus to ask what the infectious potential was. You could say this is an outrageous smoking gun. You could also say this is a perfectly reasonable thing to try to understand the infectious potential of these viruses. Right. It's a standard kind of experiment that's been done many times. And this is pretty benign, though probably worth being careful about. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think those are important experiments to figure out what what the potential to infect humans is of the of the bat yeah. viruses, and that's why that's why those experiments were done. It, and, com it comes yeah. back to how little the public really knows about what goes on in virology and stuff like that. It can look like a smoking gun if you don't know much about the subject. And again, sometimes when you put together pieces of viruses, you get junk. It doesn't always work. You, you know, it doesn't. It, you can't fit it. That's why I was <laughs> surprised what you said about about polio recombination. That it could do it with very non-homologous viruses. You know, it's interesting. It, <clears throat> in some cases, polio recombination happens very well in the intestine, but not in cells and culture. You can't mm, okay. can't get it to work there. So, but this is this brings up something else I wanted to talk about, and that is this is all. I mean, even though we all agree that the, a lab origin is highly unlikely, uh, still it's being used. Because these kinds of experiments got the label gain of function, now gain of function is, is a dirty word, and it's being used to push back and regulate. You may have heard that in Florida that you can't do gain of function experiments any longer, as if the governor knows what that means even, right? So, how, do they, how do they define it? So seems unlikely. Apparently, apparently the old PPP, the NSABB pandemic potential, those, those before the, the broader definition. So um, I'm sure you've been thinking about the, the gain of function issue. Tell us what, you, what you're thinking. Yeah, so uh, for the people who have not had to pay attention to this, every detail of this, um, gain of function was a term that came about when uh, over 10 years ago when people were studying H5N1 and trying to study the transmissibility of it um, and what makes it transmissible and if there was some change that could happen that would make it transmissible in mammals. So um, it, it's extremely lethal when it, when it does get into a mammal, but it thankfully doesn't spread. So what do we need to be worried about if it, you know, if it, if we see it evolving in the wild? That what are the mutations that we really need to worry about? And it got termed this like gain of function experiment that, you know, this this gain of transmissibility or pathogenicity was really what they were worried about. And um, but the the term gain of function has spread and gotten wider over the years, and there have been some attempts to make it. Refined, so that's the enhanced pandemic pathogens of pandemic potential, EPPP, right. um, and it falls into other research called DERK, which is Dewey's Research of Concern. There's like an acronym every every five minutes, um, but you know, basically the the gain of function research people were want you to um, this is research that is scientifically meritorious. So, and then it goes to this other committee to decide whether you should do it. And there are rules about what you should or should not do, but people can't really define it. And that's, that's really the, the problem here, is like if you're a scientist and you wanna study the transmissibility or pathogenicity of a virus, how do you know when you've crossed the line into something that you need to submit to the NIH and get approval for? And my, my problem with this is that I don't think you're going to be able to quick really identify what puts you into this different regulatory category. The National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity has said that you need to submit experiments that you can reasonably anticipate will create this, this uh, quality. But I don't think that you can reasonably anticipate what the results of your experiments are going to be. And so um, I, I worry that this uh, regulatory morass is going to discourage scientists from even asking these questions, which are super important. I think it'll discourage students from going into the work um, and, and wanting to pursue it. And, and this pandemic killed a lot of people. We need to figure this out. Like we need to get better at fighting the next virus, whether it's you know, in the next pandemic, whether it's flu or, or another coronavirus or something else. And, and so we need to study transmissibility and pathogenicity so that we can get better at fighting these things. So that's one of the reasons why over the last 
years, um, scientists have, uh, lab leakers have added to this that we need to get better at biosafety, but often what they mean is that we need to shut it down. Yeah. And that's, that's my concern. So I want to do something that's more positive and proactive. And just thinking about, you know, there was a time in science where, where, where there was a lot of fear about work that was done in the lab um, in the recombinant DNA mm -hmm. days. Sure. And there was a big conference held in Asilomar where scientists got together to figure out like what is and what is not allowed and what kinds of experiments should be done, what kind of safety mechanisms we need. And a lot of the mechanisms that were built then, we still have now with institutional biosafety mm -hmm. committees. And so uh, we at Hopkins and with others, including Susan and whoever wants to be involved with this, want to do a repeat of that um, only, uh, you know, less, on, not having it only white men from the U.S., um, <laughs> like in a um, but to make it, have an international meeting of virologists and biosecurity experts and biosafety experts to, to say, like, what, what kind of rules do we need for, for this kind of work? Because the rules that are coming from NSAB or from the governor of Florida are not going to really yeah. help. The problem with NSAB is they're actually hijacked by four or five individuals who you and I both know, who are very vocal and who insist, for example, that virologists cannot regulate their own experiments because we're too conflicted. And so people who don't have any expertise have to do it. Well, I mean, you can't regulate if you don't have expertise. And, right. and it, it can't be the only people that you have involved. I mean, you want to have people who have different perspectives. You want to have mm -hmm. people who are lawyers and ethicists and, and biosafety experts. But you, you can't do a good job in figuring out what the rules of the road are going to be if you don't involve the people who are driving. And, and so that's why we are starting this, this, we wanna have this, we've been calling it the 555 Penn Initiative because it's going to be, the meeting is gonna be held at the 555 Penn building that Hopkins now owns in DC. But we, we are building this, trying to have a positive, you know, like what should this work be regulated mm -hmm. about, you know, and how can okay. we bring all these people together? I think that's great to grab the initiative and take it away from the naysayers, right. essentially, right. which is what's happening. And you, you're going to these? You guys are both going? Is that right? Sure. <laughs> I'm not invited, but I... No, no, no. Everybody, invited. absolutely. <laughs> it, it seems like there's really a role for sort of simple... Um, uh, educational activities, re reminding people of high school biology and how it bears on thinking about, you know, basics of SARS-CoV-2 infection and spread, lab leak hypothesis argument, everything like that. Maybe a series of, of videos for, you know, the for non-specialists to try to be edu educate them in these matters. I think it's it's important for everyone to get involved because in my in my feeling, this is a threat to the future of science because you're gonna be increasingly regulated. And I think it's main, it's in part politically motivated because I'm sure the governor of Florida knows he will get votes by opposing gain of function experiments just as he opposed masking and vaccinations, right? It gets votes, that's in the end what it, And if wearing a mask got votes, he would be in favor of that. So <laughs> right now the climate is over half of the US believes this virus came from a lab. So Politically, it, it's going to benefit you to support that, and I think this is the danger we face. And we're going to be more and more regulated unless we we, we say something. I mean, but there's also this. Gigi and I've talked about this: the scientific regulation of uh, people thinking that we could do all this with pseudo viruses or with informatics or with in silico, and I think that's limited. I mean, you can learn a lot from those kinds mm -hmm. of approaches, but to sort of cut off the real working with the real pathogens is a huge mistake. One thing that probably deserves to be more widely known is the Ebola virus vaccine is is a constructed thing where you put the envelope of Ebola into a different virus. And that's it's a gain a, of function, right? Yeah, that, you yeah. could call that gain of function. You could call it a highly effective vaccine against a very scary virus. Well, I think more education is important. That's why we do TWIV, but unfortunately we don't reach enough people. So everyone needs to do something who's involved in science. A scientist, I, I, I had a meeting recently I met someone um, who was on the AS NSABB, and they've recently voted to expand the organisms that are being regulated, which is really unfortunate. I said, why did you do that? And he said, I'm just too busy. I, I don't have time.
And that's what we all get into. We're all busy and we don't have time to spend on other activities, but in fact, they're all our activities, right? I mean, I don't have a problem, and with I think a, there's a mistake to it's a mistake to think that you know that regulation would be harmful. But there's it's a matter of what regulation you're talking about, you know, and 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 it has to be something that makes sense because if it doesn't make sense, people are just going to work around it or they're not going to do it at all. And so you know, we want I think people want to have accountability. They want to do things safely. They want to do things you know, in a way that's, um, you know, that communicates that they are being careful, but it can't, you can't stop the work. Otherwise we're just going to not be ready for what comes next. Yeah. I think that's, that's the key point. If you put too much of an obstacle up, especially with experiments that are harmless and it's only because the people proposing the regulations don't understand the experiments. That, it's very easy right. to be on the rhetorical level with this kind of yeah. stuff. Like, yeah. well, you're going to create a devastating virus that could kill millions. And it's like, well, I, I don't really know. I'm just like working on these mice things here. So, you know, it's not really, I mean, I don't know how you can, yeah. it has to be boring and technical, I think, to, to, to work. And, and who's going to make these decisions? Who's yeah. going to decide what's okay and what's not okay? I mean... Well, that's a good question. You know, ultimately, it's the, it's NIH who provides the funds, right? So right now, the NSABB guidance applies to NIH-funded research. So if you're doing it in a company, you don't have to abide by it. Is that well, correct? Well, the NSAB that? wants to change it so that uh -huh. you, if you're doing that for a company, then yeah, it would be it would also fall under this regulation. Hmm. But it's not a done deal. That was draft uh, recommendations, and uh, over the next several months, I expect that there will be opportunities for people to say what they think about about those draft recommendations to the government. And I, and I, we're not at a point where there are regulations yet. I had another quote I wanted to tell you. Um, this was from. Uh, this is from, I think, uh, Robert Kennedy. Oh, God. <laughs> he Junior. said, Junior. Yes, the guy who was running for president, right? He said that this alleged work, the construction of SARS CoV 2, mm -hmm. um, may have been a violation of the 1972 Biological Weapons Convention. <laughs> may have been an alleged work, right? But people don't hear those qualifiers and this will get him votes, of course. So uh, I think that uh, science, science is great, as you heard at this meeting today, but it won't continue the way uh, we've known it. It's already changed from how you and I started, right? Um, but I have to say, we never had to do anything in the lab. People smoked in the labs. We did whatever we wanted. <laughs> and they mouth pipetted, and they did mouth all kinds of stuff. Yeah. We had a class in the micro uh, uh, department, uh, it, graduate student course, where an elderly faculty member talked about mouth pipetting anthrax. I'm not kidding. Oh my God. <laughs> Don't combine that with smoking, because that's not a... <laughs> I want to also, in the last, last minutes now, let me read another. <laughs> this is from an article uh, from Warby. There are no tenable scenarios that can explain the presence of both lineages besides two independent spillover events. For this to begin as a lab accident, one person would have to be infected with lineage B and then go to the market. Then another person would have to be independently infected with lineage A a week later and go to the market, each leaving no trace at the laboratory or any other location in a city of 11 million people. Such a convoluted scenario is exceedingly unlikely relative to the simpler explanation that it was introduced uh, at the market itself. So um, the market was clearly the epicenter, and it is virtually certain that the emergence was linked to trade in live wildlife. Anyone who tells you otherwise either doesn't understand the science or doesn't want you to understand it. I think that's a great way to summarize. All right, any last comments? Fred? Um, I echo what Warby said. I think the... Um, there are enough uncertainties that I wouldn't say I was 100% certain by the intelligence uh, standards, but um, I think it's highly likely that the um, virus started in a bat cave and was transmitted by animals to Wuhan. Susan? I was going to say that I wish that when we had discussed these sorts of things, we went more by the scientific evidence and we didn't sort of uh, have fantasies about what could and couldn't happen or what might have happened or what 
you know, or what coincidences might be, <laughs> but, but that we actually went by the but scientific that's, evidence. That's only what scientists do, apparently. I guess so. And but we're scientists. everyone else doesn't. And I think it's amplified by the pandemic, which brought science to the forefront and then the interface with the public, right? And now we see what happens. It's yeah. really, uh, it's, I mean, I think the, the aerosol transmission of H5N1 kind of got it going, but then it receded. But this really, really amplified it. A any other th further thoughts, Gigi? Just that the, the, the focus on the lab situation and biosafety and what, you know, what we should be doing there really takes away a lot of the emphasis that we should be placing on, on One Health and trying to prevent mm. epidemics from becoming pandemics. And we, need to, we should be doing a lot more to do surveillance and research on bats and you know, lots of different things that can give us knowledge that will be helpful. And we are not doing that. And instead, we're just focusing on, on picking on scientists who are trying to do good work. I think we have a communications issue also. Right? Scientists aren't great at communicating. And um, we're busy. And I've, I've switched jobs, so I do this, but I can't do it myself. And you know, one of the things I wanted to bring up, let me bring it up. It's really hard to prove a negative, And scientists will just tell that to the press all the time. And then they say, oh, it must have been then. And so I think you have to be really careful about saying, oh, we can never prove that it didn't happen there. Don't say that. You just can't say it. You just got to give the evidence for what you know about. And, and that's the strength. David, any final thoughts? I think um, you know the, the, this is a horrific global event. And something like this is going to happen again in the future. And we should learn the lessons from this and be prepared. and. Um, you know, figure out how do we do better? Because I think there's no government in the world that handled this properly. Um, the responses were abysmal and people died as a result of it. Um, and then one other thing, um, it's kind of the uh, boogeyman du jour is uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and how is that gonna play into the science that's, that's out there in the world today. I, I read an article about uh, Google had a program that dealt with uh, protein mapping and folding. And they, science, people before that said this is a 50-year computational problem. And the Google program solved it in a weekend. So uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> the genie is out of the bottle. All right, that is TWIV 1017. Show notes, microbe.tv slash TWIV. Questions, comments, TWIV at microbe.tv. If you enjoy our work, and that's a work of spreading science with eight different podcasts, please consider supporting us. We don't do ads. We don't monetize our videos. We depend on philanthropy, which is support by people who believe that science communication is important. So you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. If everyone gave a buck a month, we'd be all set. and We could make a great science communication company. My guest today from the University of Pennsylvania, Susan Weiss. Thank you. Thank you. Fourth time. <laughs> and she just got into the National Academy of Science. Yeah, congratulations. congratulations. That's awesome. Also from the University of Pennsylvania, Rick Bushman. Thank you very much. Thank you. And from UPenn, David Johnson. Thank you very much. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, so, uh, so do you use your, your former skills as an FBI agent in your current position? Sometimes uh, I have to do psychological profiling with how to figure out what academics are going to do next. <laughs> and from Johns Hopkins University, Gigi Gronval, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Ronald Jenkins for the music, and Jolene for the timestamps. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>